I'm Barbara Peters. Welcome to this episode of The Criminal Calendar. We're really going to rock and roll today, or at least we're going to start with kind of a rock and roll entry because our, Greg, our guest today, our Greg today, and our guest today is Greg Isles. Hi, Greg. Hi, Barbara. I have had the best time today on your website where I have been listening to your musical career and excerpts from the band you now have, The Rock Bottom Remainders. Tell us a little bit about them. I wouldn't say I have that band. I feel like a lucky participant in a, this carnival road show of other writers. For people who don't know, it's Stephen King, Amy Tan, Scott Turow, Ridley Pearson, Mitch Album. I, I run out of Dave Barry. Dave Barry, the leader, fearless leader. The fearless leader, Roy Blunt Jr. Roy Blunt Jr., uh, sometimes Critics Chorus, Roger McGuinn a lot of times of the right. birds. And Matt, is it Greening? Is that Matt Groening is Greening. how Dave says it. And uh, the funny thing is in the, we did the 15th anniversary show a while back, not long ago, a few months, and um, Stephen King was asked about the band and he made a joke about Dave and Ridley and I and he said, you know, Dave and Ridley and Greg take this so seriously, they're like a bunch of type A personalities taking their GRE exam. He said, I'm just the hood ornament on this van. <laughs> and it is sort of like that. Steve shows up just drifting on a cloud, does what he wants to do, and we're sort of the night before frantically putting it all together so it doesn't fall off. You know? Well, if, if the reader were to go to your website, gregisles.com, they would see embedded therein YouTube excerpts from some of your performances. Now, in the course of my Microsoft collapse today when I had nothing else to do, I listened to these. And I have to tell you that I, de I couldn't decide whether Mitch singing Billy Joel <laughs> or Dave singing with Ridley backing him up, but I wasn't quite sure what he was singing. You did a great job with Paperback Writer. Thank you. But the band, I thought, as a whole was best in Midnight Hour. Yeah, I think so too. Well, Ridley can actually sing. And uh, different people sing with him on that. The high point for me, though, was not captured in YouTube, and that was they gave me a choice of adding a song, and I said, Don't Fear the Reaper, and I want Steve to sing it, because that had been the theme song of the stand, and, the, and I knew he was just a freak about that song. And the band, before I joined, when Barbara Kingsolver played keyboards and the personnel was a little different, they sort of had a threshold of what they could and couldn't play. If it had more than two and a half chords, they couldn't go near it. But now, more of us are pros or ex-pros, and we added that song. And to sit there in New York and watch Steve go crazy with a cowbell and sing Don't Fear the Reaper from the Sand, I just, that was the height of my musical career, I'll admit. It's interesting that you say about the professionals and non-professionals. It's clear that Ridley, you know, and of course we all, we, we both know that he started as a musician and became a writer like you. Dave obviously is comfortable with, yeah. what is he playing? Is it a guitar? Dave plays rhythm guitar and he's a lot better than he claims. And Dave actually fronted a band called the Federal Duck in college. He, does, he doesn't admit to it very much, but I think they did take themselves very seriously. Well, I also learned from the website that while you were born in Germany um, in 1960, you grew up in Nashville and you were in a band called Frankly Scarlet. What was that? That was, uh, that was a real band. Uh, that was in the idiocy of 21 to 27 years old of uh, playing in the Southeast through colleges. I mean, I actually made a living doing it and we played original music and covers but we fell into that trap of uh, just having to pay the bills and make a living and I figured out by about 28, thank God, that I was never going to be, you know, John Lennon or Sting and I thought the last thing I ever want to do is get a real job and so I gave myself one year to write that book and that was And it. that book was Spandau Phoenix. Spandau Phoenix. Shameless attempt to sell books because my theory was if I could sell enough books I'd get a chance to write what I really wanted to and it turned out to be true. And that was the first of, we're up to number 11 here? 11. With third degree and they've all been remarkably successful. They have the, and the, the miraculous thing to me is that they've been successful and they're not all the same book. I mean, In fact, you that's know, your hallmark, right? That's my hallmark, and it, it, I think it's taken me a lot longer to reach the high level of success I've gotten to now, which is not the highest level, and I think, frankly, I'd sell a lot more books if I did, we've talked about this, do a series character and sort of make more concessions, but I just never was willing to, and I think over the years, the audience has slowly grown incrementally, and until now, 
I can uh, do what I want to do and not get flack from the publishers, you know. There are some authors, Manette Walters is a British example, who, like you, has always written different books. I have a feeling, from what I know of you, I wish I knew you better, but from what I do know of you, that you would get so bored that the books would really suffer, but by giving yourself a new challenge and a new track every time, you know, it, it's kind of like going to the well and starting all over again. Something hit me last night, I wouldn't say this to anybody but you, but I, after enough times coming to the store, you pull things out. Last night people were asking me about the series character issue and I said, you know, I've never written it, I've had a character repeat, but I realized last night I am writing a series character. Which and is? I'm the character. I've been oh. writing myself for 11 books. I'm every character in those books. And probably every writer who's worth his salt is, you know, I mean, any writer who says he's not writing about himself or herself is lying, I think. If the book moves someone, very few people can make something up whole cloth and, and move people. Now, I'm not saying the books are real, but what I'm saying, it's what I've talked about, how all of us have a finite amount of insight because insight is bought with suffering, you know, and we all have a finite amount of suffering. And I feel myself as I write these books doling out a little nugget, you know, and invariably it's that little nugget that someone emails me from Finland or China or Mexico and they say I cried on page 375. It's invariably the same passage of the same book. It's something that I took from my own life, a precious thing, transmuted it into something fictional and that's what moves people on all sides, because we're all the same. We're all the same, and to me, that's all books are. A good book, if I, in a good book, if I can find four or five insights where I have that moment where I just go, I felt that my whole life, if only I could have said it that way or voiced it. That may happen three, four times in a book, and I feel lucky if I get four or five in a book. And of course, the timeless writers are the ones where the book is nothing but that, but that's the rarest thing there is. That's literature, And right? that also comes with experience. I mean, that's why I've always been slightly skeptical of young Turks, you know, writing absolutely brilliant first novels at age 24. I mean, how much have you got, you know? Yeah. How much value, how much life experience, pain and suffering? You know, would you say that, that because you were, what, 28 when you started work on Spandau Phoenix? Yeah. It was more a book that drew on, on history. Drew on history, and truthfully, I'll just, I'll tell the complete truth. When I span down Phoenix, I realized at that point, I don't want to work for a living. I want to do something I love doing, or, so I wrote a book like the books I was reading at the time, which were Jack Higgins and Robert Ludlum and the people who sold a lot of books at the time. Now, as soon as I had done that and gotten a contract to write another book based on that, I turned around and wrote Black Cross, which may be my best book. And the difference in those two books to me is Spandau Phoenix is like a Tom Clancy novel. It's driven by very interesting plot and a lot of historical detail and a lot of action, but there's very little soul in it. Whereas Black Cross is set in the Holocaust. It's, it has a plot, but it's really about character and human history and feeling. And so I would, you know, when you say the Young Turks, well, I think of these guys who come out at 24 and just blaze across the literary firmament with one book, and I think, I sort of think of that like Mozart. You know, they may have all the talent in the world, they just haven't lived that much yet, but you see that virtuoso ability with language or something, you know? You do. Well, I, Mozart was my personal favorite composer, and the part that I liked best in Amadeus was when they said everybody else had first drafts. Exactly. Mozart's. Mozart took dictation from God, they exactly. said, because it was note perfect. And that's why the fate worse than death, that movie captured this too, is to be Salieri, to be just good enough to know better than anyone else how truly a work of genius it is, but not be able to do it yourself. Absolutely. You could see that that was the rancorous part for him. The canker in his soul was that he could see the genius, but he couldn't be the genius.